Hallelujah! <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> this is Russ and Kitty. Though that sounded like Bishop Bill Hammond. Okay. That's his signature. That's his signature. Hallelujah. And yeah. Bill Hammond, Bishop. Excuse me, Bishop Bill Hammond mm -hmm. of Christian International down in uh, San Rosa Beach, Florida. We love uh, the beaches on the Emerald Coast. That's so beautiful. Uh, we got a chance to go there for a little bit till Irma ran us off, Hurricane <laughs> Irma. And uh, recently, just a few vacation days we had when we were on our East Coast trip. Today, today, we are going to learn about Jonah. Jonah becomes fish food. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to title it, uh, Are You Future Fish Food? <laughs> In our chapter today, we're introduced to Jonah the prophet. Jonah is sent to a wicked city, but he refuses to go. He knows that if they repent by his preaching, they'll be spared. And Jonah wants to see Nineveh destroyed. And so Jonah attempts to flee and he runs headlong into the tempestuous insistence of God that he must obey and go to Nineveh. As a result, he goes completely overboard. Have you ever seen anybody <laughs> go overboard? Have you ever gone overboard? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, go, we wonder, what were you thinking? Or you wonder, what was I thinking? But maybe it's a conspiracy of the sovereignty of God because you've been running from something he told you to do, and you wound up going overboard like Jonah. But that's okay, that's not the end of the story. Because God will prepare something for you <laughs> to get you back into his, his will. So Jonah chapter 1, it's 17 verses. It's really a book of a different character uh, to some degree uh, because of the nature of the narrative and the story. Uh, probably no other book, no other passage in Scripture except for maybe Genesis 1 or the story of the resurrection provokes more incredulity, even among Christians, that absolutely do not accept, cannot accept what you read in the life story of Jonah. But Kitty, if you'd begin with Jonah 1 and read all 17 verses, please. Yes, sir. Good morning, everybody. Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of oh, Amittai, yeah? mm -hmm. saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to, unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, and so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares of, that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto to him, tell us, we pray thee, for those cause, uh, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thy corruption? I'm sorry. What is thy occupation? Corruption. It's the same thing. Uh, and whence camest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? <clears throat> and he said unto them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men that he fled from in the presence of the Lord, because, I'm sorry, for the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. 
<coughs> then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempest, tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so the sea shall be calm for you, unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us the innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I love that they said, uh, they found Jonah asleep, said, what? What meanest thou, O sleeper? <laughs> How many of us could say we've been in a circumstance that we didn't know what was going on around us? And it's like, you need to wake up. And what did he need to awaken from? Well, it's reflected in what it says in verse 10. He said, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the God of heaven. No, he didn't. <laughs> he was mad at God. He was trying to avoid doing what God, what he feared. If he feared at all, he feared the goodness of God. Because the reason he didn't want to go to Nineveh, while God gave him a message of judgment, he knew that God's intent in sending the message was to deliver the city of Nineveh and bring it to repentance. And he knew God was so good at performing his will that that city would repent and he didn't want them to repent and so what was he running from he was running from the goodness of god he did not want god to be good to people that he hated and despised the book of jonah it's written somewhat in the time period of amos and and uh, primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel. And it's about the same time period as Jeroboam the second that Amos prophesied during Jeroboam the second's reign as well. It's an account of the exasperating experience of the prophet Jonah when he is faced with the fact that God loves everybody, even the people that he's going to allow to come and take the northern kingdom into captivity. God loves them. While it's a book covering events in the life of Jonah. There's no explicit mention. Jonah doesn't say, I'm writing this book. And so uh, we don't know really anything about who wrote the book. Uh, it has similarities. Textual critics, textual scholars tell us it has similarities to the narratives recording the events in the life of Elijah and Elisha. So some suggest it might have come from the same circles. Um, and if that was the case, it's very likely to be among the sons of the prophets that Elisha and Elijah interacted with, perhaps. Uh, or at least in the institution handed down generationally by them. In other, it, it covers events in the life of Jonah in the 8th century B.C., but it might have been written, in fact probably was written very much later after even the southern kingdom, not just the northern kingdom, uh, went into captivity. And it, it's an example to us as well of how many of the prophets, something we've never discussed at length, how that many of the prophets not only prophesied to their own people, but they would be sent, not just prophesy, like Amos prophesied from Judah, the southern kingdom, into the northern kingdom, but he didn't go there, and other nations as well. But if this is a case of God sending Jonah, actually sending him to a foreign land to prophesy, extending his ministry, as it were, to other nations. Many have questioned the historicity of this book, suggesting it's merely a fictional short story or parable made up out of the author's imagination. Primarily, why do they say that? Because of the story of the whale. 
because of the account of Jonah being swallowed by a fish and surviving, it offends the analytical thinking of the Western mind that automatically will doubt such a fantastic story. Uh, but yet, there's no indication in the book. There's no indication in the book that it is, in fact, fiction or allegory or metaphor. It is presented as a matter of fact, accounting actual events in the life of Jonah as he contends with God over the fate of the city of Nineveh. In verses 1 and 2, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. God commands him to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria. If you remember, the northern kingdom went first into captivity to Assyria, and then the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and absorbed those captives in the northern kingdom. And then later Babylon came in about 100 years after that and took Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, captive. Uh, here again is an example of God not just dealing with uh, individuals, but with nations and specifically in our chapter cities. God sent Jonah where? To a city. Has God ever sent you to a city? God deals in everything we read in the scripture, in both Old and New Testaments, in the words of Jesus, the preaching of Jesus, as much as he spoke to individuals, he spoke to cities, to people groups. Uh, and that's not a concept that we have. The idea of community is not a sense of belonging. How many would suggest you belong to the city where you live? No, it just happens to be where I live. Western people are highly individualized in their thinking, and it re it's reflected in our theology. Well, every... Whatever you decide about spiritual things, that's your individual choice. I even know families that b believe they're just walking in the level of piety of, as deep as anything God would suggest, and they have never, ever, ever imposed one iota of their spiritual upbringing upon their children. And I'm talking about tongue-talking believers going to full gospel churches. Well, we don't want to put it up, push it on them. We're going to let them come of age and make their own decision. And that flies in the face of the kind of thinking that God deals with cities. He deals with, we, we're so individualistic to the point of excluding the idea of God dealing with, with uh, larger people groups. But God sending Jonah to the city of Nineveh. In contemporary Christian thought, we generally hold that all persons, great or small, will stand before God and give an account. But over and over and over in the scriptures, including the Old Testament, the, the pastoral epistles, the Pauline epistles, and even in the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, we see cities are held accountable. Your city, the sin of your city, is something that the population of your city will be held account accountable for by the population of that city god will call that the scripture says that there'll be a day that cities will stand in judgment in other words as i've said before after all the individuals are judged then we would say okay i would like the city of nashville to come forth i would like london england to come forth now and be judged we need to think about that would you be held? Would you be willing to be held uh, accountable with your city for the sins of your city? And if you're held accountable for the sins of your city, then what can you do to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem? Because silence, an insular, indifferent uh, uh, posture in your city is not going to be an excuse. Well, God, I didn't have anything to do with that. I just lived, that's just where I got my mail. No. If, if you really believed, and the scripture contends this through, from Genesis to Revelation, that cities are held accountable and people in those cities, what would you do differently? What would you? We're ambassadors, the scripture says. But most people live their life like they have no accountability to anybody other than themselves, and they're going to wake up on a fleecy white cloud and go to heaven and sit in a barco lounger for the remainder of eternity. Now, you have an accountability. How are you discharging the accountability you will one day answer, not just for yourself, but for the sins of your city? 
Jonah, for reasons that become clear in the narrative, instead of willingly go to Nineveh, flees from the presence of God, taking a ship to Tarshish. Why did Jonah flee? What did he think or what did he know about God that would cause him to be repelled by the thought of speaking to the city of Nineveh regarding its wickedness? You'd think, yeah, God, crush him, destroy him. I'm going to go up there and preach to him and we're going to call down fire. It's, this is a very similar account to what Jesus did in Luke 9 when his disciples, they were passing a city in Samaria, which is also northern, the former northern kingdom at the time that Jesus was with his his men. And they said, you want us to go call down fire? He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. I did not come to destroy, but to save. They hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans were utterly despised. And so they were readily, they were ready to see fire come down. Now think about it. Who, who do we look upon as the average uh, evangelical Christian that if that if fire came down, something happened, some calamity happened to some people group, uh, would we sit back and cluck our tongues and said, I knew this would happen, I knew they didn't change their ways, but yet somehow it would be okay with our world if that happened. Well that's what Jonah is struggling with. That's what Jesus confronted his men about. Jonah has Jonah would fit really good with the twelve disciples. Because they were all about calling down fire from heaven. And you have people no, no different than that today. They want to be like Elijah. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? It's the days of Elijah. Well, honestly, I would disagree with that. Because Jesus in Luke 9 said, No, you don't know what spirit you're of when you want to call down fire like Elijah. Because they actually asked Jesus in Luke 9, Do you want us to act like Elijah? He said, No, I don't want you to act like Elijah. Because I didn't come, like Elijah, I didn't come to destroy but to save. And Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of, pro spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And so these guys that are strutting around, calling down fire, going around, stalking the aisle, who am I going to rebuke today? They are not prophesying out of a new covenant paradigm. They are not moving. You've you got to make up your mind. You're either going to prophesy in the spirit of Elijah or in the spirit of Christ. You cannot do both. And Jonah understood something about the clemency of God. He wanted to see the city of Nineveh burn. And because he knew if God was sending him to Nineveh, the point was that they would repent. And he wanted to make sure they didn't repent because he knows destruction is coming. And another factor in this is, this is an example. This entire book is based upon what, by today's standards, would be a false prophecy. Jonah claims God tells him the city of Nineveh is going to be destroyed. It didn't happen. By anybody's metric to, in today's world, not just people who don't believe in the gifts, but people who claim to believe in the gifts of the Spirit, to believe in the prophetic, to believe in the prophets, they would look at Jonah and they would say, that's an example of false prophecy or in er an error in prophecy because he prophesied something that didn't happen. And they'll quote that verse. Well, if they prophesy something that doesn't happen, don't listen to him, Moses said. Well, really? Is that a blanket statement applying to all prophecies? Well, Jesus, in that case, if you prophesy something and it doesn't happen, that makes you, and most people are quick to say, a false prophet then by that metric, both Jonah and Jesus are false prophets because they both prophesied something that did not happen. Jonah was to prophesy the destruction of Nineveh. It didn't happen. Well, you just missed it, Jonah. What does it feel like to be wrong, Jonah? And Jesus prophesied that the 12 disciples would sit on 12 thrones judging Israel. That, that is not going to come to pass. Why? Because Jonah, Judas, excuse me, excluded himself. Unless you believe, like a Unitarian, that uh, Judas is going to be forgiven, and Judas is going to be restored, and Judas is going to sit on 12 thrones judging Israel. So you have to have a grown-up. These people that hurl these accusations as though they have some sort of authority, they don't read their Bible. And so, so in speaking in defense of the Bible, they reveal the fact that they have very little biblical knowledge. It's not about defending the truth. It's about pontificating, being a little, strutting a little Napoleon, pointing the finger at everybody they don't agree with. 
So Jonah, he doesn't want to see the city of Nineveh repent. So he takes shipping to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. But the Lord sends a storm against the ship to impede its way. The mariners, they're alarmed over the prospects of their imminent destruction, so they're crying out to all their gods. Think about that. They're crying out to all their dependencies. What is idolatry? External dependency. Storms coming. There's a storm in this nation. What are we going to do? Let's run to the voting booth. Let's let's uh, spend more money on the military. When people are under pressure, they cry out to their gods. What provokes you when you're under pressure? When you look and you see that the your nation is like a ship. When you see a nation headed in a direction, what's the answer? You will expose your dependencies by what you do next. If you run to the voting booth, if your passions are inflamed in the political arena, it's because that's your God. If your passions are inflamed because we need to go drop a bomb on North Korea, well, that's your dependency. Where are your dependencies? So they're crying out, you know, however they find Jonah... Jonah's fast asleep. Now, these sailors, veteran mariners, Mm -hmm. are so terrified that they're unloading the ship. They're screaming, calling out to their gods as they climb the rigging in in the ship, and Jonah's asleep? Isn't it interesting how Jonah acted asleep in the boat during the storm and how Jesus acted? There's a, there's something there to be learned. So Jonah's fast asleep and he's awakened with the news we're all about to die. Now, there's several things we need to notice here. Number one, God sent the storm. Confusing father's discipline with demonic activity. When Jesus was walking on the water as they were rowing in the sea, they looked out and they said, it is a spirit. And if you look at it, it's the word for demon. Jesus was showing up in a bad situation, and they confused what Jesus was doing with something that was demonic because he was doing something they'd never seen him do before. So how many times do we confuse? How many times, like Jonah, Jonah basically, because God loves him, whom he loves, he chastens, he's putting Jonah over his knee, and he's paddling Jonah's bottom And Jonah is kicking and looking over his shoulder saying, I rebuke you, devil. I rebuke you, devil. Because he doesn't understand, or maybe he does in this case, that God is doing something. God sent the storm. Remember the story of Joshua when they took Jericho and then they went to take Ai? And and Ai only had a handful of men, but they killed a bunch of them. They fell before Ai, and the problem was Achan. They couldn't get done what they needed to get done because Achan had stolen the Babylonish garment. And so they had to deal with Achan in order to have success. The sailors had to deal with Jonah in order to have success. When someone is out of God's will, things don't go well. And so you turn that logic around. Well, things aren't going well because God loves me so much. I'm so godly. I'm just glad it was me because somebody else couldn't bear up under this burden. God just knows how strong I am in him and I'm suffering. No, maybe you're just like Jonah. Maybe somebody needs to just pick you up and toss you over the rail. You know, thank God for Peter. Peter didn't have to be thrown over the side. (laughs) He took a willing leap. (laughs) Somebody's out of God's will. In Joshua's case, Achan was discovered with the Babylonian garment, the wedge of gold. In the storm, Jonah admits that he's out of the will of God. And what's the answer? He said, yeah, sometimes you have to let somebody go overboard. You ever see somebody go overboard and you're looking at your spouse and the two of you are having a conversation without speaking? Your eyebrows are talking, you know? Well, and well, we better stop and talk to him. Oh, really? The Bible says the Messiah, he said, is smoking flax, he will not quench, and a bruised reed, he won't break. In other words, it's, Jesus didn't see it as his job to put out somebody's fire. 
Sometimes if somebody is smoking and if their situation is about to combust, you need to just let that happen. Sometimes you have to let somebody go overboard because God is at what if, and see, and they didn't want to do that at first because they started rolling. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to save this guy. Good luck with that. There's three things that are really important we need to see here. Number one, God sent the storm. Number two, Jonah was asleep. Number three, the crew cast lots. Isn't that interesting? These three things were all caused by and controlled by God in terms of what happened next. Now, regarding God sending a storm, I thought Satan was the prince of power of the air. Be that as it may, God gets involved in things that are otherwise held to be under the sway of the enemy. Are you listening to me? He doesn't do this to destroy Jonah. You know the word oppression means to press? But how many have experienced God putting pressure on you? Pressure is pressure. And sometimes we misidentify pressure God brought some pressure is to crush you. Other pressure is to bring to the birth. Ask any woman who's had a baby. Are, are you listening to what I'm saying? Some pressure is through much tribulation we enter the kingdom, and that word means manifold pressure, different kinds of pressure. I have a pop-off valve. When I'm under pressure, I'll sit down, I'll make that noise. And Kitty's like, what is that? It's my pop-off valve because I'm under pressure. And then go. Sometimes it's the pressure of God. We have to know. Again, sometimes God will deal with us in such a way that in our self-interested mentality, we confuse. We don't like pressure. We tend to run from pressure. You need to learn to press into the pressure. Amen. And you break out into the kingdom. When you press into the pressure, you break out into the kingdom. There is an entitlement in God. What is the kingdom? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness basically means entitlement. Righteousness means everything you say and do becomes as effective as if God said it or did it. Religious mentalities camp on the other side of the pressure and say, no, that's not true, that's not God, that's just his idea. Uh, yeah, well, those that think that way, I got news for you. If you will look into that place where you fear to go, you'll find me looking back at you because I know what it is and we know what it is to push through the pressure and to break out into a place of entitlement where everything you say and do becomes as effective as if God said it or did it. Amen. Is that because we're so spiritual? No. It's just that we came through some pressure and it wasn't the devil. That's right. It may not have been pleasant, but it was a pressure and many people don't want to go there. Don't want to, don't want to put their marriage on the line. Don't rock the boat, baby. Don't rock the marital boat, baby. And let's just live in the lukewarm, tepid uh, wading pools of the things of God because you don't want to rock the boat with your spouse. Because you don't want to uh, put things with your kids in jeopardy. Because you don't want to put your job in jeopardy. You don't want to step out. You don't want the pressure. And so you march in place till Jesus comes in a little wading pool of religious thinking. And you'll look back one of these days and see how far afield you strayed from what God really had in mind that would have utterly fulfilled your life, but you didn't have the courage to step out. So God gets involved in these things. He doesn't want to destroy Jonah or the sailors, but to bring Jonah back into conformity to his will. We also see that Jonah's disobedience put others in jeopardy. The sailors were going to die because Jonah disobeyed. The other amazing thing is, as bad as things are, Jonah's fast asleep. This reminds us of the sleep that God caused to fall on Adam at the beginning. God wanted Jonah not to be aware of what was happening. Did you ever walk into the middle of a bad situation and have your eyes opened? I didn't know I was getting myself into this. <laughs> Sometimes God keeps you in the dark. You ever have God keep you in the dark? Jeremiah got mad at God for doing that. He, he, got, he thought God, God allowed him to believe that his preaching was going to save the nation. And when he saw it wasn't going to happen, he said, you deceived me. <laughs> called God a lot. What did he do? He called God the devil is what he did. <laughs> 
God deceived him, and he used his own prophecies to do it. There are moments when God will allow you to walk into a situation without letting you know ahead of time what's going to happen. Finally, and you say, well, why would he do that? Because he's God, and he knows more than you do, and he's bigger than you are. (laughs) I have this statement because the Lord said this to me one time years ago. I was upset because I knew God was doing something. He's putting me under maximum pressure, and I did not like it at all. And God has such a sense of humor. He he said, uh, Russ, your father has this problem. He thinks he's God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he I've said that, and I, I don't know why. I have offended many people by making that statement. You know, we do the daily prophetic word. We say, the Father says today, I cannot tell you how many of religious-minded people will send me this batter. They'll start hammering me with questions through email. Who is this Father you're talking about? Goodness. Do you believe in Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, they're so foreign. They've, they've got this fatherless mentality. They don't see God as Papa. And when somebody talks like God is his Papa, remember the Pharisees p- took up stones to stone Jesus because he said God was his Father? Trust me, I know what that's like. <laughs> father's heart ministry. <laughs> what is the Father's heart ministry? Well, have you read the book of Jonah lately? <laughs> Many times Christians, what about uh, when they, uh, uh, they started casting lots to see what was going to happen? Proverbs 16, 24 says. 16, 33. 16, 33 says man, man cast, casts the lot. God decides the outcome. Yeah. But yet, if you do something like that, they'll say that's not spiritual. Many times Christians say God doesn't use the casting of lots are putting out a fleece, as Gideon did. I've heard that taught against. But clearly, if we're reading the book of Jonah, that's not the case. God got involved in the casting of lots to expose Jonah to bring about what happened next. You're not unspiritual to put out a fleece or to cast a lot. I remember I quoted that verse, Proverbs 16, 33, And for several years in a church that I pastored, when we would make decisions in the board of elders and deacons and we weren't really clear about what the Lord wanted us to do, I quoted that scripture. I said, do y'all believe the scripture or do we want to take this verse out? Proverbs 16, 33, uh, we want to take that out of our canon. You know, that's, that's not true. Oh, we believe it's the word of God. We believe the leather is genuine, Brother Walden, Brother Pastor Walden. I said, okay then. Here's our decisions that we can't seem to make because we don't know which way to go in this situation. In the church business meeting, here we go. I'd flip a coin and I'd say, call it. And somebody would call it for one way or the other and we'd look at it and whatever that coin said, that's what we would do. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you the adventures we had in God doing just that and how amazing it was. Now, having been brought to the end of himself, Jonah says, look, just throw me overboard. They don't want to do it. It's interesting how pagan idolaters had so much compassion on Jonah that they don't throw him over immediately. They row with all their might. It's like I remember one of my sons uh, got arrested. They brought nine felony charges against him, and none, none of them were true. But we but we didn't know how it was going to turn out, and I needed to get that poor kid out of jail. And uh, I went to church. I didn't tell anybody. Why would you? You're not going to tell anybody when something like that happens. And I went to to church and uh, the pastor, who I thought was a dear friend of mine, he came up to me and rebuked me. He said, don't you dare ask anybody in the church for anything. You need to let that boy go to jail. Just lock the the jail and throw away the key because we're not doing anything to help. And if you ask anybody to help, I'm going to come against you openly and publicly. How dare you? And I hadn't asked anybody for anything. I hadn't even told anybody. I don't know how they found out. Mm-hmm. And uh, But when I went to work Monday, I was on Sunday, when I went to work the following day, my pagan boss, one of the most sinful men I've ever been personally connected with in my life, who's absolutely ungodly. You would, I mean, to 
come under a roof where he was, you're going to be concerned that the building might fall down on him. He's so ungodly. He calls me back to his office, and for the only person that's ever done this for me, he handed me a blank check and said, go get your boy. The mercy of pagans many times mm. is so much better and so much deeper than what Christians show to one another. But finally, they, they can't prevail against the storm. They know the boat's going to sink and they throw Jonah overboard. And as soon as they do, it becomes calm. Now for the sailors... The narrative ends there. That's the end of it. But it's not the end for Jonah. See, this is where the narrative of those who don't know God ends. But for those of us walking in relationship with the Father, there's an extension to this story as God works to give Jonah a second chance. Oh, he's the God of the second chance. Hallelujah. Thank God. How many would like a second chance today? Everybody stand up, please. Just lift your hands toward heaven. We're going to appeal to God. And what we're really doing is saying, God, send a whale to swallow us up. Because <laughs> <laughs> Jonah is the, the archetypical idea. It's like, let's go up to Zion, and Zion is the parched place. <laughs> Christians are so clueless about the things they pray. God prepares a great fish to come and swallow Jonah up to spare his life. Oh, thank God spared my life. But not only to spare his life, but when he is spewed out on the beach and he's wiping all the gunk from his eyes and he looks and he realizes he's at the gates of Nineveh. Why? That's a perfect picture. God saved Jonah, but then put him right where he didn't want to go. It's a picture that he is both Savior and Lord. That he wants to save you, but he also, he, God is, <laughs> he's the ultimate territorial spirit. He wants to have his way. And if we don't give him the cooperation, he will conspire in events to move you right where he wants you to be. What about your own life? Many times people know God has placed a call on their lives. They know God has commanded them to be and to do a certain thing or be in a certain place or to be involved with a specific people. I remember God made me go to church, <laughs> this particular church. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to go. You ever have God make you go to church? Mm -hmm. It's like one preacher said he was in a meeting. It was really bad. And he didn't want to be there. He said, God, I, I don't want to be here. And God said to him, says, what do you think? I feel like I have to come here every Sunday. And this church, uh, for various reasons, I just didn't like going there. Uh, and the Lord finally told me after about six weeks, he said, are you going over there this Sunday or do you and I have a problem? <laughs> I will be there. Look, I went to a church, another church one night, and God was after me for weeks to go into a situation where I knew what would happen. And sure enough, I was physically assaulted in the church, in the sanctuary, with all the people standing around. I knew what was coming. And God wanted, you want me to go there? <laughs> <laughs> he's a good God. And he's so loving. Often we respond in this passive-aggressive manner, assuming if we don't know, we're or are willfully ignorant, then we aren't accountable. See, we hide behind this, well, I'm just not sure what God... That thing that you're not sure God wants you to do, that's exactly what God wants you to do. <laughs> and the Lord says, we're going to do this, we can do this one of two ways. We can do it the yoke, easy, burden, light way, or we can do it the way I do things with obstinate, disobedient, passive-aggressive children, sweet rebels who cower in the corner, clutching their Bibles, and just being victimized by their own ability to hear God. You don't have a problem. The Bible says you do not have a problem hearing God. If, if the scripture says, my sheep hear my voice. So uh, by lifting of hands, how many of you have difficulty hearing God? Okay, that's because you're a goat, not a sheep. 
He said, my sheep hear my voice, another they will not follow. That means if you're living out of your sheep nature, you cannot be deceived. Are you listening to me? And those who are deceived are those who have trouble hearing. They, they talk about the trouble hearing God as though it's, it's something they should be um, uh, sim- have sympathy. We should have sympathy on those who are struggling to hear God. Now, what they're struggling with is their goat nature. Goats butt. Goats turn their, uh, you can't turn your back on a goat. Goats will eat anything. And so if you're dealing with people who have, have trouble hearing from God, even if they're a sweet rebel about it, you know when you get around somebody who persistently and perniciously has never been able to say, I hear the voice of God clearly, you know, to the dimension that that is true about them, you can't turn your back on that person and you better use wisdom. Because people that can't hear from God, they also have an ego. And their ego will condemn anyone who hears God better than they do. Are you listening to me? Jonah didn't have that privilege. He knew what God was saying. He just wanted to talk God out of it. (laughs) And sometimes you can negotiate with God. But when it comes to the mercy of God, he determined to show Nineveh that's non-negotiable. God, would you bless my enemy with a brick? (laughs) No, that's non-negotiable. What has God commanded you to do? What has God told you to do that you haven't done? Because you don't want to rock the boat. Because you don't want to bring pressure on yourself. I got news for you. God has a much more, it was less pressure for Jonah to go to Nineveh than it was for him to be swallowed by a whale. (laughs) So pick your poison. You can either deal with the pressure of compliance to what God has told you to do and Hiding behind, there is no uh, validity in saying, well, I'm just not sure. No, that's rebellion. If you're not sure, it's because you're a goat. And you need to repent and start living out of your sheep nature, not your goat nature. Are you listening to me? God's told you to move to a city. God's told you to do something on the job. God's told you to go to a church or not go to a church. God's put things on you. He said things to you, unimpeachably said things to you, and he said them and he said them, and you're finding reasons not to do it. Do what God told you. God God will not give up. He He never walks away from a fight. He's going to have his way. Do you have to be fish food? before you'll go and do. Do you want to be an example of obedience or do you want to be a cautionary tale? There's a lot of people in the aftermath of of disobedience when God makes them do what he told them to do, then they're not a vessel of honor, they're a vessel of dishonor. They're an example of don't do it that way. Don't do what I did. Please don't do what I did. We saw somebody the other night in a lecture who was an authority in the area that she was lecturing on. But the fact of the matter is, she was an example of how not to do something. She was actually an example of failure in the things that she was claiming to be an authority concerning. So we're either going to be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. Learn the lesson of the prophet Jonah. For some of you, that means start gathering boxes and call the U-Haul company. Mm -hmm. For some of you, it means resigning from a position in your church, from going from a place of comfort and convenience to somewhere that is not so comfortable and convenient. Some of you, it's when your spouse uh, sits down to dinner with you, I need to talk to you. God's told me to do something, and I know you're not going to like it. Like my wife told me one time, God told me to go to Kansas City, give a prophecy to such and such a person. If you won't go, I'm going to get on a bus myself. And he went. And I went. (laughs) Because why? I don't want to be fish food. How about you? Father, thank you for your word today in Jonah. Stuff we've heard from our youth, most of us. And we want what we want is to have spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying. So we can work quickly with you and see the benefit of that. Because we've learned over the years, Father, that on the every time there's an act of obedience, there's a reward. We thank you, Father, for tenderizing our ears and our hearts to know you and to obey you quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.